Welcome to Local Lives. Today we've got a super cool episode coming to you. We've been hanging out at the Indigenous Art Market at the TELUS Convention Center. Get an inside look at the market and pick the brains of some of the vendors here and really get to know them and their art and their stories. Hi, my name is Chance Belliard. Uh, I'm the owner of Redman Customs and co-creator of uh, the Indigenous Arts Market. Hi, my name is James Britton. I'm from James Smith Cree Nation and I'm uh, owner and operator of OG Native Arts. Can you tell us about the Indigenous Art Market here at the Towns Convention Center? Yeah, it's a uh, collective of uh, Indigenous artists all across uh, Canada, all the way up to the north, all the way across to BC, and then some to the east. And uh, it's a collective of artists of all different variety. We have um, beaters, we have people who make ribbon skirts, we have people who make visual arts, uh, kind of a, just a wide variety and a, a nice uh, collective. The market kind of came to be as, as a, a sort of a, a collaborative approach. Uh, when we when we started out, um, we kind of started building markets and, and building a community of, of people who were really invested in coming together and, and um, you know, um, showcasing their works. And I think that uh, between James and I, um, you know, we really wanted to be inclusive in the community and, and, and treat uh, everyone from every uh, from every area from from Canada uh, with respect and and acknowledging that their arts and contributions to those are really important. We have to thank Telus Convention Center for being so inclusive, uh, for literally inviting us with open arms, and uh, just understanding what reconciliation is, what it looks like, what it means, and uh, just really giving us the space to do whatever we want. And then uh, as a as a community of artists, we've came together and kind of uh, just collaborated and, you know, who, who should help where. Um, some people have been, uh, you know, volunteering their time. Um, some people have been doing performances, bringing family members in to do performances for us or with us, sorry. And uh, yeah, just really coming together, putting our heads together, figuring out together what's working, what's not and where we can make changes to, to bring more people in. I think that, um, you know, this being our first year and, and first time partnering in such a such a good positive way with uh, Calgary Tells Convention Center um, is leading a path for future markets, leading a, 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 a brighter future for all Indigenous artists to come together collectively um, and showcase our work and, and be in these really public spaces that are not traditionally used as uh, as as indigenous markets or in gathering places, and so I think that the Calgary Tells Convention Center really felt that and really wanted to open that space for for those those opportunities for us.
How y'all doing? My name is uh, Scott Lubbockan. I'm from the Driftwild Cree Nation, which is along the Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, I'm currently based in Edmonton, but I constantly come to Calgary because the art market here for Indigenous art is actually very supportive, and I actually love coming out here because people appreciate my art, and that's why I love coming to Calgary. How long have you been uh, creating art for? I've been an artist my entire life. Uh, I don't want to say how old I am. <laughs> but yeah, I've been an artist my entire life. I've been painting for about 15 years. Yep. And as you can see, like my art is, you would consider it like at first glance to be very simple, but there's a very specific reason that I do it that way because I am uh, actually a trained illustrator and an artist and I do realism as well as like illustrative art. But the reason that I do these pieces is because uh, being from Northern Alberta and being Cree, we have a belief that our people are never really gone and they kind of always watch over us. So this is my tribute to like the star people that guide us and watch over us. Also, I used to be a youth worker and a lot of indigenous youth don't really know their true identity. And that's why all my pieces are faceless. And then some of my pieces actually have like face paint on them. I would consider it like a warrior's paint, right? Or tribal paint. And that's usually because I've met youth in my life where they kind of have like inkling, right? Or like a yearning. They know there's something deep inside. They know there's a piece of them that they want to discover inside of them. And that's why I put those, that face paint on those pieces. So my pieces being very simple are actually very complicated pieces in themselves with the story that they tell. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no you, problem. Do you have a favorite piece you've ever created? I actually do have a favorite piece. It's, it's not actually one of these pieces. Uh, cause I grew up in the nineties and eighties. I have a charcoal piece of like Bruce Lee that I did when I was younger. That's kind of my favorite piece. That's my piece for myself. But if it was, if it was one of my own pieces, I did a piece, my very first piece that I did like this. And I don't know if you guys can see out there, but like the piece down here, like this style that is down here, uh, this was the very first style of like star people that I did. And the very first piece I did was actually honored towards MMIW. And uh, it was very close to me because I have an auntie that I lost to that. And that was probably the most significant piece that I ever did. And I'm glad that it actually went to a really good home. Yeah. Do you ever have a hard time letting go of pieces? Uh, that one. That one I had a hard time letting go with. But I actually spoke with the people that bought it. And they, they showed me that it was going to go to a really good place. They appreciated it, right? And I know I, I needed to know that it was going to a home where it was going to be loved like for the rest of that piece's life kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad it did. Yes. If you could summarize your creative work in one sentence, what would you say about it? Summarize my work in one sentence, eh? Oh. The best way to put that would be I hope my artwork makes you think, makes you wonder, and whether it brings you pain, joy, or love, I just hope it makes you think and ask me questions of what our culture is all about. And how has it been received here in Calgary at the art markets? It's actually been received very well, and it's very interesting because it is Calgary Stampede. Uh, there's so many people here, like from the UK, Australia, and everything else like that, and I've received a lot of appreciation for my work which is really nice, right? Because you could have people that come in and they don't understand the work or I guess it'd be like almost like cultural appropriation of your pieces, right? As opposed to appreciation. Whereas I've actually had like a numerous amount of people actually come in, hear my story of what my pieces are and it kind of like, it resonates with a lot of them and they're willing to listen, they're willing to understand and I, I appreciate as an artist that they're actually willing to learn, especially like my dad being like a residential school survivor, for them to actually listen and want to, you know, take in that knowledge and understand what Indigenous art is and where our people are coming from when we create our art. I really actually appreciate it this week. It's been quite impactful. It has, yeah. Now, what does appropriation look like as opposed to that appreciation? Uh, appropriation is... Someone who, for, for me as an artist, actually, because I do such a different style of art, appropriation is someone who comes in and they are looking for a very, a very generic piece of indigenous art, kind of something you would, you would normally see from an, a lot of like indigenous artists, but 
artists who even try to imitate our style and whatnot, they kind of look for that, right? Because throughout history, what actually happened was uh, indigenous art, there was a very specific piece that was done and it went to a museum. And I, I can't remember if it was in the 19, like 1910 area or the 1920s, but that piece kind of cemented what our art should look like. And there's a lot of indigenous art that kind of looks like that artwork now. So now you have a lot of indigenous artists who are changing the script, right? They're rewriting how art can be received and how we perceive it, how we create it now. So the way it is now is like, if I paint you an apple, that's an indigenous apple, right? Like that's a Cree apple and that's the way it is now. So yeah, I guess a lot of people, you can tell right away, somebody comes in and then they try to look for like, the best way is like prints, right? Like those prints that people sell, if they go to a print that is looks exactly like that art that has been around for like almost a century, actually a century, then you can tell those people are only looking for that as opposed to actually appreciating art and hearing your story as an artist. So how can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? Hold space? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, yeah, like the center we're in right now, like the Telus Center, they really did a good job like hosting us, bringing it in and tr creating that relationship. And I'd like to see that like from more people, right? Like creating that relationship with indigenous artists. And I, I got to commend them because they've done such a good job. And I think more, more of like Canada itself needs, needs to do that for indigenous artists and not just indigenous artists, but artists in general, right? Because some of us, this is what we do. This is our livelihood. This is our life, right? And we've done everything else. Like I, being an older guy myself, I've been in the logging industry. I've done those things. I was a bouncer back in the day. I was a youth worker, which was probably my most heartfelt job that I ever had besides being an artist. But yeah, I think it's just hosting and creating those relationships and having a real dialogue and actually listening to what we want as artists. Do you have any advice for any Indigenous looking to become artists? Yes. Work. Constantly, constantly work. Don't stop creating. Don't stop doing what you do. Don't try to imitate anybody. You know, find out what works for you, find out what works best for you, because at the end of the day, a person's going to connect with your art and what you do, as opposed to you trying to create something that you think is going to sell. Thank you. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing? I hope, I honestly hope they would be proud. I believe they would be. And for anyone watching who hasn't been to an Indigenous market today, oh, who's <laughs> For anyone watching about the Indigenous market here at the Talos Convention Center, what would you like them to know if they've never attended? Come on out. Honestly, if you've never been to an Indigenous market, come on out. And you need to come to a market and you need to realize that Indigenous people are much more than moccasins that you would see, right? And like the knickknacks that you usually buy, dream catchers, are moccasins. Even though those things are beautiful and they have so much meaning, and I do hope you support the artists that create those, but come on out, hear our stories, look at the beautiful beadwork that's being created, the artwork that's created, and just see that we're, we're so much more than what you would normally expect from an indigenous artist. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time here and your knowledge. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Come on out and appreciate what we do because we appreciate you for actually coming out and learning about our culture and what we do. Hi, hi. And that's thank you, Akri. Hi, hi. Kwanak. <laughs> Tanse Oki. My name is uh, Axis Stoyina. My colonial name is James. Uh, I'm from James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. What can you tell us about your art? I've been doing art my entire life. Um, I've been uh, I've been told I started art when I was about two years old. My mom had me drawing and coloring, and uh, slowly through time, I guess I developed a style. If you could describe that style, how would you? I started with. Um, with street art and graffiti when I was a youth. I used to go to like the uh, the at-risk youth programs in Saskatoon. And uh, that's where I learned how to do a lot of graffiti and, and, and street art. And then it slowly developed into uh, indigenous art, I guess is what it's called. As I found my indigenous voice, I kind of found my, my art style as well. So they went hand in hand. So it's really evolved, hey? Yeah, it's absolutely evolved for sure. And I'm always evolving. I'm always trying new things, um, never really staying stagnant. And I base, base my art off of my culture, 
Um, and then things I see in nature and then also my dreams. My dream spirit is uh, a large um, influence of mine with my art. Do you have a favorite piece you've created? Uh, favorite piece? Not really, no. Um, I've done so many that it's it's hard to say. Some of my favorite pieces are the ones I've done in school with, with the youth because of the experience that I've had with the youth at that time uh, really reflects that that mural. But uh, I guess one of my favorites up to date right now would probably be the uh, the Chinook Lodge mural that I did at SAIT. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you ever have a hard time letting go of any pieces? Uh, no, because in my heart, I always make the piece. Um, I always make my art, whether it's jewelry or visual arts, it's always for someone else. It's not for me. It's for me to create and then for someone else to enjoy. Um, sometimes I do make jewelry where I, I know that it's it's for me. I, I know that it, it's not for anybody else. So I, I usually will keep, will keep some pieces of jewelry that I like. Thank you. I'm just jumping back to the, the mural you just talked about. Can you tell me a little more about that? I was contacted by um, the manager at the Chinook Lodge to come in and and uh, indigenize the space because it's a, it's a space that's about 21 years old and it was built for the indigenous students. They were lacking representation and inclusion. Um, going into that space, especially for an indigenous student, you want to go in there and feel at home. You want to feel welcomed and you want to feel like you're part of that community. And when the, the walls are blank and there's not much representation, it almost feels like an oppressed space. So me coming in, being asked to indigenize it a little bit more and, and share some culture and, and brighten up the space was an honor for me. So I went in and we had a little bit of a basis of like a, a basis of an idea of what we wanted to do. And then I just, uh, I had a few dreams and visions about that space. And then I just implemented my, my visions into that mural. How impactful was it when you finished that piece? For, for me, it was, uh, it was very impactful for one. Of course, I'm not out here looking for recognition, but the recognition that I received was, was overwhelming. It was, um, it just kind of showed me like where I'm at in life and how skilled I am with, with artwork. And it really just helped me, uh, I guess, showcase my, my artwork in a larger, on a larger scale. And then the, um, the feedback that I got back from the community, indigenous and non-indigenous at say, was just, again, overwhelming. So blessed to have that, have non-indigenous people be so uh, excited to see the art, just really honor it and, and see it for what it really is. And then having indigenous students tell me that my art's really helping them, um, just come to that space and feel more at, at home and feel more, more of that community aspect. That's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How long have you been involved in the indigenous market community here in Calgary? Uh, so I started, I started actually like, I guess, building an inventory about nine or 10 years ago. And then, uh, I had a good friend reach out and say like, Hey, you should probably try and sell some of your work or try and showcase it. Um, and then I got an opportunity to go to uh, round dance. So I got a table there and, uh, you know, I, I met some really good people. Um, I made, I made some money, which was great. And then I kind of realized like, Hey, this is a, this is a huge community here. And this is like something that I never really asked for. It was kind of just shown and given to me. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to really honor that and just see what I can really make of it. So it's been, yeah, almost nine years now. And it's been, uh, been super fun, a really, uh, really enjoyable experience. It's incredibly inviting and inclusive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you have any advice for any indigenous artists looking to get involved in the market community here? Um, advice for sure. If you want to do it, just do it. If you want to decolonize and be, be an artist and showcase your culture and work, I say, do it, take the risk. And, uh, and just try it out. I mean, it's not for everybody. Um, but if, if you have that feeling inside you that, you know, you really want to share your artwork and you have a lot of, a lot of, uh, work that you want to, you want to make some income off of, um, take those risks, just do it. Just, just try it out. You know, it's, it's not going to hurt to, to come out here and try and uh, make those connections and try and make an income and then eventually building yourself up to where you can be self-sustaining and then decolonize. Thank you. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? Um, 
Well, I guess when it comes to that, it would be when it comes to non-Indigenous people or organizations giving Indigenous people space, I think that's very important because um, obviously the societal norm is that non-Indigenous people are in the higher ups in companies um, and they usually have the, the say in things. A lot of Indigenous people we don't because of the barriers that have been placed in society against us. So really um, like making those connections with with non-Indigenous organizations and companies that understand what reconciliation is versus us coming in and having to explain to them what reconciliation is and what it looks like. It's nice to, to work with people that just get it. They just understand what it means without having to try. And then it's very natural that way. Makes it a lot easier for everyone. Yeah, exactly. It makes it so much easier for us and then also for them. Now, can you speak of what cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation looks like? Yeah, for sure. So what I say to my clients is if you're here in these spaces with uh, local Indigenous artists and you're supporting us by purchasing um, our work off of us, that's appreciation. You're appreciating our culture. You know, you want to wear some, some of my jewelry, even though you're non-Indigenous that's okay. Everything I make is for everybody. I'm not just making stuff and saying only indigenous people can wear these things and appreciate them. I make them so anybody from around the world can appreciate them. Um, there's, there's a huge difference between appreciation and appropriation. The, the best way that I describe to, to not appropriate is to make sure you're purchasing your work off of the actual artist himself or themselves. Sorry. Thank you. Now for anyone who is not Indigenous, who's never been to an Indigenous art market, do you have any advice for them? Yeah, um, you know, if you're reluctant to, to come by and you're thinking those, you know, those narratives where, oh, the markets aren't for us or we can't wear those things and we don't want to appropriate, that's not why we're here. We're given these spaces to open it up to all communities to come in, meet the artists, meet the people in our community and make those connections. Whether you're um, supporting us financially or you're just supporting us uh like verbally coming out here meeting us and uh and just building a friendship with us you know that's that's really all it's about we're here to share our culture and we're here to learn off of other people as well because we can't reconcile without that absolutely now if you could describe your art in one sentence what would you come up with oh that's tough because i do a lot of different stuff i do the visual arts of jewelry um, for me, I would describe my art as powerful cultural imagery. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> now, if your ancestors could see the work that you're doing now, what do you think they would say? You know, um, all I can say to that is I hope, I hope that I make them proud with the stuff that I do because I'm able to do the things I do today because of their seven generation prayers. If they weren't so resilient through colonialism and genocide and praying for the next seven generations, then we wouldn't be here today. So I give it all to my ancestors and I'm here because of that. So I just, I just pray that uh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm sure they're proud. Thank you, thank you. Now that's all the questions we have for you today. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Come on down to the, the uh, local markets that we have here in Calgary. Meet the uh, beautiful people here and introduce yourselves your families we can all meet and become become friends like i said whether you're supporting us or not you come you come through these uh spaces and you meet us and we're making those connections and we're just furthering um you know the reconciliation process thank you so much for your time and your knowledge of course, of course thank you Are you ready? So uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm the owner of Sweetgrass Skin Co. So we are an all-natural skincare company. And we use traditional black for remedies in each one of our creams. And it's I'm just proud of my culture to kind of share the uh, all-natural, uh, the natural way of healing. And um, this company was actually born out of necessity. I'm uh, actually allergic to coconut. So 99% of all creams out there have coconut in them. So we had to get creative about seven years ago. And... Um, 
yeah, so this was kind of born out of necessity. Um, we uh, originally didn't really want to do this. I'm actually a commercial plumber. That's what I do during the day. We started doing this and friends and family were kind of pushing us to, to, to start selling it. And me and my wife kind of fought it for six and a half years. And then um, finally we decided we'd, we'd do it. And uh, yeah, it kind of all fell into place. We've been a company now for a couple, couple months now and we're selling all over the place. And uh, I was just really proud to be able to bring my culture into, uh, you know, and giving it to somebody that they can use it as a product. And um, yeah, and just kind of teach people when we're selling it. So, yeah. Do you have a favorite product? Uh, our gather. So the one with the yarrow in it. So yarrow is a flower that's traditionally been used by the Blackfoot people and most prairie, uh, prairie, uh, based, um, natives it has multitudes of different, uh, healing, um, healing benefits to it. So, um, it's really good at healing, uh, dry skin. Uh, a lot of our customers use it for eczema, sunburns. Uh, bug bites. Um, so yeah, they've done tests on it now and it has uh, anti-inflammatory topical pain relief um, and anti-inflammatory properties to it. So, and that's just something that we traditionally used as, as a Blackfoot people. So it's really cool to be able to infuse it into something and give it to people to use. And it's amazing to see all the reviews coming in and being like, you know, this, you know, we're, we're able to, you, you've, you've changed our, our, our skin care for our skin care for now. And, um, and you have to see, I have a repeat customers and everyone seems to be really happy with it. So, yeah. Well, it's crazy that uh, medicines that have been used since time immemorial are now getting that scientific backing. Yeah. It's very cool to be able to see that, yeah, that there is actual scientific data behind it. And then just, we used it for hundreds of years. So, yeah. Can you tell me about the Tallowed Be Thy Name? Tallowed Be Thy Name. Yes. So that is our, our pain release. And so um, in it, we use... Uh, Arnica, which is a little yellow flower, and it grows in the in the foothills. And um, they traditionally, they our people used to just take the flower and either eat it or uh, she just rub it right on the joint that was having that was in pain. Um, but now we uh, take it and we actually infuse it into the cream, as well as we use um, cottonwood, which is the popular. So that's actually where uh, one of the active ingredients in aspirin comes from. And so what the arnica does is it, it encourages circulation. And so um, it kind of helps the inflamed area, and then that opens up the pores and allows the cottonwood resin to get into your pores, and it gives you the topical pain release. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So <laughs> so, how long have you been selling at these markets here in Calgary? Uh, this is actually our first market in Calgary. We've done mostly uh, small towns and just around the surrounding areas, and then online purchases as well. Um, so we sell across Canada, um, as well into the United States and we have had so, uh, sales in Australia as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Global. Yeah. And, uh, we are in talks with going into stores as well now too. So it's kind of, it's really taken off and it's really cool to see our culture really take off like this. So what's it like to experience that? It's been like, uh, like, I, like I'm speechless, honestly, uh, to tell you the truth, like it's. It's like we never thought that it would come together like this. And, you know, we went from selling in mason jars to friends and family to having our custom artwork done by um, my sister-in-law. And so it's really just a family company. So, and yeah, I guess our sky's the limit now. So <laughs> do you have any advice for any uh, Indigenous who are looking to become entrepreneurs? Just do it, honestly. Um, it's amazing just if you just kind of put, you know, put effort into it. And if it's really your passion, I mean, like, like I said, we're so, we're so blessed to be able to be where we are and it's, we just, yeah, just keep, keep at it and don't let anyone tell you different. Cause we've had a lot of people, you know, tell us that, yeah, oh, this is not going to work out, but it's really, uh, yeah, it's come a long way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit on what cultural appropriation versus appreciation looks like? Yeah, I'm excited for people to use this. I'm excited for people to get into use our tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, as long as you're coming with the right intentions, I mean, yeah, I don't see a problem. Awesome, what about the appropriation aspect? Appropriation, it is like a little frustrating to see some of our culture fetishized um, and kind of just, you know, used to make money. Um, so like I said, it's all about the intention behind it. Use it respectfully and not for a profit. Thank you. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous? We can be welcoming. We're not, we're not scary. <laughs> <laughs>
we would be big, but we're not scary. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, just hosting events like this. This is an awesome uh, opportunity to be here at the Tele Center. Um, it's an amazing facility, and they've been nothing but kind to us. And so, um, I'm just yeah, incredibly blessed to be here and happy to be here. So, for any non-indigenous who have never been to an indigenous market before, do you have any advice for them? Just come say hello. We're all friendly. Um, you know, we're all ready to talk. We can talk your ears off, as you can tell. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, just come up, say hi, and uh, yeah, like we're we'd be more than happy to tell you where we're from and explain our our roots to you. Even if you're not going to buy a product, just ask us about where, like, what what tribe are you from, and you know, like we're happy to explain it all to you. If you could encapsulate the business in one sentence, how would you describe it? Traditional Blackfoot remedies. Solid. Yeah. Big point. <laughs> now, if your ancestors could see the work that you're doing, what do you think they would say? I would hope that they're proud that we're still um, putting like a modern spin on it, but still keeping the tradition at its root. Absolutely. I think that's all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, just come on down and uh, go to an indigenous market. It's fun. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Ford Johnson. So where are you from? I am from Masaki and Cree Nation, which is in the middle of uh, Manitoba. How long have you been out here in Calgary? Uh, since 1996. Holy school. I'm actually uh, a 60 scoop survivor. So when they came and actually scooped us up and the, the two youngest ones were me and my brother. So I was actually sent to the States. So I was adopted there. And then I came back home in 96 to find my family. That's incredible. How did you reconnect? Um, there was a, used to be a program that was called uh, the Repatriation Program. Canada used to have and and so when a person was adopted out, whether, you know, from the residential schools or the 60 scoops, they, what they did is um, you were able, when you came of age, you were able to sign up in that program. And then you, you hope that other families were your siblings, right? Well, it signed up too. And then, so that's kind of how it went. That's how I met everybody and reunited with my family. It was the best thing that I have ever done. I can imagine. When did you start creating art? Well, I started when I was about five. So I used to sit there and doodle. Um, it was my getaway because the way I was raised wasn't um, always that nice because we were actually in the system for a little bit. So you're juggling from home to home and so my escape was always art. And I started drawing and then I started painting as I got older and... How has it evolved since you reconnected? Well, <clears throat> because of the stuff situation of how I grew up and it wasn't always, you know, uh, I wasn't raised in a very nice, wonderful home that people that you trusted. So my way of... Um, we're escaping was art, and that was where I found um, my spirituality, um, reconnecting with my culture, oh. and it just happened, right? You just connect with, um, it's, it's like you're in a total different zone, right? You just, it's like anybody with, think, whether they're writing or my into sports or dance or music or whatever, right? It's something you're passionate about, right? So this is what became, is, is my passion. When you look at some of the paintings that I do, it's, it's about the spiritual, right? The warrior that's within yourself, right? And so when I'm thinking about my spirituality and I see myself in all the, of these images, I see um, my spirituality in them so this is kind of when I, I call them spiritual warriors, right? And then when you connect with animals, 
they have that same spirit, right? They have that same light, right? Um, every living thing has a light to it, right? So that's just kind of why I, I do what I do. Do you have a favorite piece you've created? My favorite piece? Oh, my goodness. It's really hard to say which one because, like, you got this one, you know. Like, each one of these has a story behind it, right? And when I when I think about it, um, some of the pieces actually make me cry because I get thinking about certain events in my life, you know. Uh, example, this horse one is what I, I was a young girl and I was alone and I didn't have that many friends or anything like that because the way I was raised, I was raised in a Caucasian family and um, so I didn't have that many friends and so my friends became the horses, the horses in the big field. So I used to go out there all the time and just sit there and just stare at the horse, you know. And they says, I don't know if it, if I could ride that horse, right? So then I go out, walk out to the field, and I used to just open my hands, and they would just come to me. And then I just pet them and pet them, and then it all soon get it starts the sun starts setting, and then I would leave, right? So one day I I did it, that horse let me. I rode bareback. I was like a teenager, and I I got on that horse. And it was like, it's like you're floating, you know? And it just, because we just rode together. And ever since then, you know, I just remember that memory. And so when I painted this one, this is what went through in my mind was that, right? It's a connection. It's, you know, and then I got told later on that none of the horses were broke. Holy cow. Have you ever ridden right. a horse before that? Yeah. Yeah. You never read it, but no, never. Holy cow! Yeah, so that's kind of, and then so that, like I said, that one there, I particularly cried because I could remember when I was a kid, right? It was I was alone, and you felt lonely, and then, but I found a friend. Beautiful, it's incredible. Yeah, so the, a lot of these are have a lot of meaning, right? So, absolutely, they're so rich. <laughs> culture and story oh thank you i i don't know really i can't really tell you which one is my favorite one i know that for sure because i mean i don't know like i said each one of them has a story of itself right absolutely how has your art been received here in calgary i uh, actually quite well right um i don't do it full time so I do it only part time, because um, I have a full time job, and so the stuff that I do, and I usually use social media, and it goes quite well. So this would be the actual second market I've done this year, for just just art alone, and which is really nice. I've met a lot of people. I know quite a bit of people already, and then, so it just because I usually get 10 of the markets anyways, but not as a vendor, more so as a person that's buying stuff, a customer, right, and so on. Absolutely. Do you have any advice for anyone who's never been a vendor before looking to become one? Honestly, follow your passion. Follow your dreams. Even if you think it's so far out of reach, just keep going forward and just try it. Try it, anything and everything. Right, that's uh, definitely. Thank you. Do you have any advice for any indigenous who are reconnecting? Uh, again, I would say the same thing. Just follow, just follow your dreams. Whatever you want to do with anything doesn't matter, right? Whether because art comes in many forms. It's not just painting. It comes in making things. It comes in writing. It comes in dance. It comes in performances and you you guys it's your art right thank you what does cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation look like now i'm looking yeah such a hard question i uh, i think when you think when you appreciate something you appreciate the time 
at the Percy Pitsit and into your work. And appreciation is more about passion. You are you are about um, connecting, right? And the other one is just you just doing it, just doing it, do it. You know, just to make money, I guess, at the moment, I want to say, right? You just, and that maybe it, it, that's not what it's about, right? Like, to me, like, today, being a lady just really appreciated this and the work. And, it, and I just turned around and I just gifted her. I think that's a dead breeze. You know, not saying, oh, well, you know, you it's this much. Da, da, da. Sometimes you have to be that way, but I don't know. That's, that's just a third question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but in reality-wise, I think it's, it's... I think people appreciate our... They really do. And the craftsmanship, the quality. For anyone who hasn't seen your art before, how would you describe it in one sentence? Imagination. That's all. Right? Mm -hmm. Imagination. Think outside the box. It doesn't always have to be, you know, um, step one, step two, step three. Let's go step one, skip a few, step ten. <laughs> of course. For any non-Indigenous who have never been to an Indigenous market before, do you have any advice for them? Go exploring. Go exploring? Go exploring, go learn. Just be there. We want you here, right? Yeah. Thank you. That's all the questions we have for you today. Is, okay. is there anything else you'd like to share? Thank you, you guys, for having me. And I'm less doing too many craziness, but... <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your time with us. You're okay. wonderful. Thanks. My name is Michelle from Matt. The company is Shelby's Beats & More. I was born and raised in Alberta, but... Um, I am Métis, Cree, and Chippewa from Manitoba, originally, so. How long have you been creating art for? Surprisingly, about a year and a half. And I do the beadwork, and it's actually my husband and his mother that do the turtles and the oxbone and stuff, so, meh. How long have you been intending these indigenous markets for? Um, this is actually my first one. Oh, wow. Um, for this, I did like a five-hour community association kind of like flea market thing. But other than that, this is the first big one. Definitely the longest one. <laughs> have you been enjoying it? It's been amazing. And I have to say that the vendors, like I, I do work on a loom. And one of the other vendors actually showed me how to do the brick stitch. And it's been very educational <laughs> all over. Um first time I smudged was actually here with Chance and a couple of the others. So it's been fun. What was that like? Well, I started my journey actually about a year and a half ago and I got back in touch with my dad. He's been in my life for a while, but he is, he was returning artifacts to different tribes in the States. So he's kind of helped me start my journey. It's been fun, educational, so the, definitely a learning curve, so. Do you have any advice for any other Indigenous who are reconnecting? Um, it's a, it's a journey, it, and it's not necessarily always the easiest one. Um, I was raised going to a Catholic school, so I didn't know any of this, like the legend of Turtle Island and, you know, the colors and the meanings for, for my art and that or anything else. So it can be a little difficult, but it's worth it for sure. What do you think yourself, when you started the reconnection journey, would say about where you are now? I'm, I'd say I'm still at the beginning, to be honest with you. Um, my dad is going to help me do with the naming ceremony, which I'm extremely excited about. So I'm looking forward to, to everything. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing now? Well, I'd like to think they're proud. And I'm doing the culture and traditions justice, so. I'd say they're proud too. Do you have any advice for any artists who are looking to get into the markets here in Calgary? Um, 
actually, I was kind of hoping they would tell me because, <laughs> like I said, this is my first market. Um, I actually did a community association, and before that, I actually tried to get into another indigenous market, and I didn't get approved. Right, there were so many of them that, that wanted in. I didn't get approved, so it literally took a Facebook post from a friend who saw this market. And then, of course, it's like, here's the email. All you can do is try. So it's like, yeah. And then I think I found out within two days that I could have all 10 days if I wanted. So it's just a matter of looking, and they're not easy to find sometimes. So it sounds like you've been received quite well here. I would like to think so. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of advice and tips and creative ideas from all the other vendors. It's, I was a server for 30 years. And then with COVID, not being able to talk to anybody, this just kind of, it's a breath of pressure. And it was much needed, so. I can imagine lots of laughter and joy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Every day. Every day. Yeah. And there's new vendors every day, so it's meeting new people every day. For anyone who's never been to an indigenous market before, what would you tell them about it? Um, well, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Um, and the customers and the people that walk through are eager to know. Um, I actually did up a little thing for the legend of Turtle Island because it's really hard to explain that entire legend to people. And I made like 40 copies. I think I have one left. So I mean, people want to know. And, and I think that as long as you have something to offer in, in regards to the knowledge of what you're trying to, to give them, they're happy. So. Thank you. Can you speak a little on cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation? I think anyone that comes in that's looking at it is appreciating it. And when it comes to appropriation, Unfortunately, that is just stress and anxiety that I have enough in my life that it's just kind of, it's not really worth it for me to, to get into it. Do I think that it's fair? No, of course not. not you know, I wouldn't try to take someone else's knowledge or culture and, and make it my own, but it is what it is for, the, for some people. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today. Thank you for all the knowledge and your time that you shared. Do you have anything else you'd like to share? I just want to thank you for actually taking the time to, to talk to someone who is new in this, right? So I, I haven't really had the opportunity to have this type of conversation with anybody. So thank you. Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine. I'm Cecilia Hamilton, and I'm from Alberta. I was born out in Hinton, and I've been in Calgary for the last 20 years. How long have you been creating art for? My whole life. Whole life. Whole life. I started with abstract painting, and then in 2017, I started prolifically painting. What caused that shift? Um, I wasn't being challenged making dream catchers anymore. Was not being challenged. So I started painting sunflowers, and then I went to mountains. Holy smokes. Quite a jump. Yeah, quite the jump. Yes. Do you have a favorite piece you created? In here? I'm not a step. You really keep thawing anything. It's either Upper Kananaskis Lake or Mount Rundle. I'm not too sure. Not too sure? Not too sure. I remember the experience of this photo, though. <laughs> yeah. What is it? It's a... 30 kilometer hike all the way around Upper Kananaskis Lake. And I stopped and took the photo myself and painted it. Holy smokes. Yeah. Crazy. That's pretty exceptional. Yeah. So I have a huge memory regarding that one. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. How long have you been participating in Indigenous art markets for? In, this is actually my first Indigenous art market. But I've participated in markets in general since about 2017. How's your work been received? People love it. And the last vendors that I had here told me, well, they thanked me for having 
bringing beauty into the world. And it made me cry. I really appreciated it. And people are in awe. And I really enjoy watching their facial expressions when they figure out that they're actually Rocky Mountains. Well, most of them. Most of them. All right. How does the Indigenous art market differ in experience to the non-Indigenous art markets? Most people that come in through the doors and including the vendors themselves are more connected to the earth. So there's more of an appreciation for the landscape paintings that I have found over the skull paintings. For anyone who hasn't seen your art before, how do you describe it to them in one sentence? Well, if you were to look at my Instagram, it would be vast. Vast, and I don't stick to one style of painting. Vast. Vast? <laughs> yeah. It's a good way. Yeah. Now, for anyone looking to get into art, what advice would you give them? Keep practicing. And keep going and keep practicing. And you are your own worst critic. Yeah. And and make sure you do what you love and what you enjoy. Because when you do that, then it's like therapy and meditation and centering yourself and going within. Especially when you love it. Yeah. Thank you. Now, for anyone who's never been to an Indigenous <laughs> art market before, what would you tell them about it? The art is beautiful here. And you no know, vendors are really the same and they all bring in different energy and, and their different passions. And me sitting here watching all the other vendors and stuff, they're all sitting behind their tables and they're working and they're doing their beating. And it's just, it's beautiful. Is it inspiring you? It is, it is. And I'm doing a collaboration with another artist here as well, which is my first one. And that's been, Quite the experience as well. Quite the experience. I bet. Yeah. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing? Keep going. Going? Keep going. Yeah. Well, Thank you. I also have another artist at my table as well. It's my mother. The artistic aspect of my family runs in the females in my family. Really strong. And she's on the wood burning hair which is only a small collection of her artwork. And she makes little medicine bags as well, which are all crocheted and stuff. So I'm quite inspired as well by my mother because I grew up watching her paints since I was really, 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 really little. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is, thank yeah. you. My name is Angel Hamilton. Uh, I was born in Vernon, D.C. I grew up in Calgary. How long have you been creating art for? I would like to say you like my whole life. Your whole life? Yeah. When did you start uh, creating these pieces? Uh, within the last couple of years, I started getting more serious as an artist. How did your artist story begin? Um, I guess I started, it started with my grandma there when she gave me a book about nature and I guess my uh, inspiration has come from, from nature and observing it and learning the, the different names of plants and the animal. What do you call this? A large, the large fairy house. Large fairy house? Yes. When did you make it? When did I make it? I made it in 2021 when I was living on an acreage. Um, I had a lot of free time. I'd like to say that it's inspired by my inner child. Yeah. How long did it take you to make? It took me about two months. Two months? Yeah. Holy smokes. What was the hardest part? Um, maybe trying to figure out how and where to place everything, really. Yeah. What sort of materials do you use for it? I use uh, all natural materials for the most part, besides the glue. Uh, bark, moss, lichen, uh, different types of preserved mushrooms. Yeah. What can you tell me about the other pieces you have here? 
Um, so I'm mostly focused on small miniature pieces. I like to mainly focus on uh, mycology. Yeah. Do you have a favorite piece you've made? I think it's definitely this piece, the fairy house. Yeah. What's the hardest piece you've made? Probably the fairy house. Yeah, the yeah. difficult one, yeah. How would you describe your art in one sentence? Mystical. Could you say mystical? Just mystical? Yeah. I think that that suffices. That's a <laughs> good way to describe it. Is this your first time in an indigenous art market? Yes, it is. How has your art been received? Um, it has been perceived really good. Um, people just absolutely feel very called to it. And uh, it always wakens up something in them, you know. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I just get blown away by, the, like, the details. Yeah. The books and everything. Yeah, very detailed-oriented. What's your, like, the favorite part of, like, the tiny pieces you make? I think my favorite thing about the detail parts of it is it makes people think and maybe slow down in the moment and enjoy the moment to a little bit more. Yeah. Do they each tell an individual story? I like to think so. I feel like every piece of artwork uh, has a different energy to it and a different um, mindset that went into it as well. So what are the most common questions you get asked about your art? Um, why mushroom? For anyone who's never been to an indigenous art market before, what would you tell them about it? It was expectations. And that every person and every vendor is different. You know. Thank you. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing? I think they would be proud. I think so, too. Uh, my name is Alexis Soto. I am born and raised in Treaty 7, but I am registered to Treaty 4. My dad is from Carry the Kettle, and my mom is from Gordon's in Saskatchewan. Thank you. How long have you been creating art for? I have been creating art uh, the majority of my life, I think, because I started off kind of painting, and then I would go to ceramics with my mom as a kid. Um, yeah, and then just kind of sculpting and stuff, and then I uh, spent time traveling around when I was younger, so then it was, I got to see uh, in the 90s, like, art installations like Burning Man before it became really big, and got to see different kinds of art stuff um, that happened all over the country, got to see different museums, uh, and yeah, and so I... But I started beading and doing these kinds of arts, I would have to say, probably about 15 years ago. My sister was a big inspiration for me. Um, she was kind of my guidance back into traditional kinds of lives and indigenous ways. So. What's been your favorite medium of art? My favorite medium is I really enjoy working with um, natural. So I like stones, I like shells, um, I like leathers. Um, but yeah, I, I really just enjoy the feels of, of the shells and the stones. And I just finished an artist residency at Fuse 33 so in Calgary here. So that has opened it up. So now I've been laser engraving everything. And yeah, it's, it's been uh, amazing. Um, that has really opened up opportunities and kind of expanded my mindset to to actually think of bigger pieces to create and to actually create big art pieces as opposed to wearables. Well, congrats on uh, finishing that. Thank you. It's awesome. Uh, how long have you been attending Indigenous Art Markets for? I have been attending Indigenous art markets now for, I would have to say, about three or so years. Um, yeah, it's it's nice now that there have been more people that have been organizing the markets, so it's nice now to, that there are more markets available for Indigenous people. How has your work been received at these markets? Uh, my work has been received really well, I think, um, just because I... I I do like to work with the natural elements. It's it's very grounding, and um, 
it's nice to see other people too working with the natural elements. So it's it's kind of a camaraderie and and it's been received nice. And I've been receiving other people as well because it's a great community to encourage and uplift each other. Yeah. For anyone who's never been to an Indigenous art market before, what would you tell them about it? I would tell them that it is a very welcoming, open space that has incredibly talented people to come and, and talk to them and get to know us. Uh, and you'll see that we are a wonderful, accepting community that just really enjoys what we do. Thank you. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? I think um, sharing <laughs> on social medias um, and also telling people where they get their art from. Um, so if they come and they are supporting Indigenous artists and they're wearing Indigenous art and they're hanging Indigenous art in their house, um, to tell people where they get it from or who they who they bought it off of. Um, maybe not necessarily remembering the person's name, but try to remember the company name. Uh, and yeah, and sharing, I guess, yeah, sharing with people, you know, um, who they've met and where they could purchase, where they've purchased. Thank you. Now, opposed to that, what does cultural appropriation look like? Cultural appropriation looks like uh, mass productions of reproduction, like mass productions of reproductions of actual art of somebody would, um, and selling it as their own. Right, so it's people mass producing dream catchers in China and saying they're from an indigenous community. Um, it's, you know, people saying they're appreciating our art by emulating it, but not giving it the, the, the recognition and, and the props that it deserves. Um, you know, kind of, they're making it their own, right? Uh, so, and, and, I, you know, I get it, old cultures have some s sort of, you know, background like that. But yeah, it's not, it's not, it's just mass producing it and they're calling it their, their own. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, if you could describe your art in one sentence, how would you do so? Uh, how do, would I describe my art in one sentence? Yeah. Um, I would describe it as a little piece of me um, that you're kind of buying. I... My art is, I don't like to really reproduce my art, so my art is all original, one of a kind when you come. It's, it's how I feel, right? Um, I like to put myself in a Zen state of mind in a place, so when I'm creating, it's just, you know, it feels right, and I like to pass that feeling along to people, so it's a, it's a great feeling to be able to create and to be able to share it with people. Thank you. Now... If your ancestors could see the work that you're doing, what do you think they would say? I think they would be very proud to see um, me come through the struggles that I have in my life and come out in a, in a better place. I think they'd be proud too. Thank well, you. Thank you so much for sharing your time and knowledge. Is there anything else you'd like to share? I'm very happy to be a part of, of all of this and to be meeting all these wonderful people and to be involved in, in this building of a wonderful community and holding space for all of the Indigenous peoples to come as well. Thank you so much. My name is Ashley Brightnose. I currently reside in Edmonton. Um, I grew up in Medicine Hat, but I'm originally from Northern Manitoba with Cree descent. Um, my mom's family comes from Tatasquiac Cree Nation in Split Lake, Manitoba. How long have you been creating art for? Um, I learned how to make dream catchers specifically when I was 16 years old in high school and picked up making earrings last summer um, when I just wanted to switch mediums a little bit. When did you start attending art markets or indigenous art markets? Sorry. Um, I started doing um, art markets in general in about 2019, I believe, in southern Alberta. Once I started going more into beaded earrings, I started joining the, ind the indigenous community in Edmonton and in Calgary. How has your work been received? 
Um, I feel like it's been received very well. Um, when I started with Dreamcatchers, they were very popular. Um, and I decided to kind of move into beaded earrings because earrings are something people like to accumulate. I myself have my own collection. Um, Dreamcatchers are typically, you only need one for each person in the house. So once you have all the people covered, you don't typically buy more Dreamcatchers. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite earring you've ever made or pair of earrings? My favorite pair would be the ones that I first made. Um, it took me a couple of years to get the brick stitch down and I finally figured it out last summer. And after I made one earring, I had actually used up all the beads for that earring. So I had to wait to order supplies um, for the second earring, but I had cried over the one earring I had made just because it took me so long and I kept that first pair for myself, so. What do you think the version of you who had just figured out that prick stitch say about where you are now? Um, I think with every pair, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Um, some days it goes really well, other days not so much. You get through the entire pair of earrings and that last bead, once you pass through it, it's, it breaks and you have to start all over again. Um, you know, some days are better than others. What would you say to anyone who's never been to an Indigenous art market before? Definitely stop by one. Uh, there's always a, an array of Indigenous artists. Um, depending on which market you go to, which vendors we have, at whichever market you attend, you could come across a bunch of vendors with earrings, you could come across a lot of ribbon skirts, you could come across an array of things that really draw people in and really make you appreciate the Indigenous culture in Canada. What does cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation look like to you? Um, for me, appreciation is buying from indig Indigenous artists, um, specifically with Dreamcatchers. Dreamcatchers is a big one in Indigenous culture that is usually appropriated quite often. I went to the dollar store the other day and there were Dreamcatchers there for like three fifty, dollars um, completely made. So obviously, you know, when you're purchasing something from an, an Indigenous artist, there's that backstory. So the backstory, you know, asking them, you know, when did you learn? Basically what you're asking me now, you kind of get that history of where that art comes from in that culture. Whereas if you buy it from the dollar store, you really have no connection to the actual history or the culture it comes from and really can't tie yourself to the sacredness that a dream catcher holds. Thank you. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? Um, by supporting us, by purchasing our work. And even if you don't want to purchase the work, um, you know, show up here, uh, make a presence and, you know, appreciate the work that's around you. And even, you know, a thank you or your work is beautiful really goes a long way to letting that artist know that you showed up for them. You're appreciating the work, taking a business card, following them on Instagram really makes a difference. Oh, if you could describe your, your art in one sentence. How would you do so? That's really difficult. Um, I don't even know. I feel like it's just whatever comes to me, whatever I'm feeling in any given day, that's just kind of what I bring to the table. Um, you know, some of my earrings are very colorful and other days they're more muted. My dream catchers have a different personality depending on what I'm working on. The crystal that I want to incorporate in there shares a story about how I'm feeling on a specific day. Um, in one sentence, that's really hard to capture. If your ancestors could see the work that you're doing, what do you think they would say? Um, so I can't speak to that. I know that my my maternal grandmother, my mom said that when she made dream catchers, she pulled the sinew until her fingers bled. I try to keep that in my work as well, uh, making sure that the, the weave is very, very taut. Um, I recently met my maternal grandfather and watching the pride on his face, seeing that, you know, someone of, in his family is carrying on some sort of indigenous culture through, um, and seeing the pride on his face really, really helps me, you know, continue creating. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. My name is Judy Everson. I'm originally from Manitoba, Broken Head Ojibwe Nation. It's Treaty 1 in Manitoba. And I've lived here since 1979, so I actually consider myself a Calgarian because I've been here forever. 
great and like I love it. And my business name is Everson Publishing and Book Sales. And I've been doing this for quite some time. It's been a passionate uh, for me for the past while, for over 15, 20 years. So I'm kind of aging myself, but that's okay. And thank you. Absolutely. So what was the first thing you've ever written? I actually, first thing I've written was Chippy's Adventures, A Curious Little Squirrel. And that's the first one right here. And that was my baby. That one I wrote about my grandma. She had a cabin in the countryside and she actually had a little squirrel come up to her and at the at her window pane and it would literally knock at the door, knock at the window pane. And so she would bring she would tell my grandpa, go get some nuts. And then so that's how that one came about. And my second one is the Brave Princess. And which is right here. And that's my first charity book. I actually wrote it for one of my for my daughter's uh, pageant sisters, who we found through them. It's a sad story, but it, it's a heartwarming too. The Brave Princess is about a little girl, Arya's journey. She had a rare brain cancer, and she, and freshly, two weeks before this book was out, she passed away. But I was like, no, I still need to honor this little one because children are our future. And she just was cut short, and she had such a spirit in Turner that made you, you know, love life in her as well. So this one, um, I've given 50 books to her family, to Petra and Jake, just so that they can sell it or do something in honor of Aria. And every time this one gets sold, I'm actually putting money towards kids' cancer or either having parking passes for the family so that they don't have to worry about parking and, and stuff like that. And I want them to like, just take care of their loved one. And that's what this one has come out from. I'm going to assume working with Kids Cancer and Cancer Canada. Just look at it to me right now. So That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And now, what's this book here? This one here is, I'm really, really, this one is special too, because they're, they're all special in a way, but this one was blessed by my dad before he passed in 2015. And um, this is about a lot of what we go through, is when we live on the reserve, and we decide to go to take the next journeys, and we go to our urban society, like Calgary, for instance, and we want to keep our culture. And they're, they're a young family, so they want to find balance between the reserve life and culture and coming to the urban society as a city. And so, yeah, so I just try to, and there's some teachings in here as well, so that they keep the culture alive and keep it to the next generations going for. Thank you. How have you seen your, your books evolve from when you first started? I actually just kept writing and writing when I was like, actually eight years old and now that I'm 50 I'm proud to say um I actually just started putting them out there seeing if people would publish it for me and I kept getting no's 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 so instead of keeping those no's and keeping me down I turned that around to a no to I'm going to self-publish myself and help others if that's what they want to do on their journeys and I really think that's important and that's how I got started with this and that's why I have Everson published in, in book sales do you have any advice for anyone just getting started in books? Keep writing. Write everything. Like if something inspires you, just write it down. I have like journals and I have notepads. As you can see, I've got a few notepads and another one here. I've actually got three stories right here in my, and the three little booklets here that I've started. So, and that's my second um, charity book. It's called uh, Sparkle, A Kidney's Journey. And... This is where we're going to do a soft launch on it. It's for August 2nd for our Kitty Foundation fundraiser that I want to do. It's actually, that book is about my brother, Gord. Um, he has renal failure like my mother did, and she has since passed, but then I wanted to do something more because my brother's still with us and honor them both. Is I wrote a story about that, and then how the journey was him and his elementary school friend, Lily. She was such a sweet pea and gave my brother one of her kidneys. Like they lost touch, like most elementary friends do, growing up and going separate ways on their journeys. And all of a sudden she came back into his life at, at just the right moment in time. So it, it really, like I'm so blessed and same with my brother that she gave a kidney to him. That is beautiful. How, is, how have your works been received by the community here at Calgary? It's been really good. I have three of them right away for book market and all three they get scooped up for chippy's adventures right now it's just on amazon or on my website 
and they all get sold up usually as one entity because they want it at each part of it. And then, yeah, so that's been such a journey that way that they each get. And I can't wait for the next two to three coming up. How long have you been participating in Indigenous art markets? Actually, just recent, um, within the last year, like I've done, this is my second or third art market for the Indigenous. And I actually find it's very welcoming. And I'm so grateful like to be with um, my Indigenous fellow artists, and, and they're so talented. To anyone who's never been to an Indigenous market before, what would you tell them about it? I would come in and just explore. Well, open your mind, have like, just go look around at the many talented artists and come look at mine as well. But for the artists around me, like they're so talented and so given that, yeah, just come in, enjoy, soak in the music. When we do have our Indigenous music, so the drummers, the, the dancers, the singers, it is such a treat. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work that you're doing now? Well, I hope they'll be proud and I hope I left a legacy because that's why I'm doing this mostly. The money is nice, but the legacy, I want to leave a legacy for my children that who also does my art illustration. So I want to give that back to them, but also I want to, for my grandchildren, future grandchildren and then, you know, great grandchildren and stuff so that when I'm not here, that they can say, look what my kookum did. My Kukum did this, and that's what is going to make me so happy. I feel loved. Thank you for sharing. If you could describe your work in one sentence, how would you do so? Inspirational to the next generation to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think that's all the questions that I have for you today. Is there anything else you'd like to share? I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone coming out to the market here and supporting us artists, and it's been a wonderful event, and I hope to have this again for next year. And please come and join it. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and knowledge. My name is Chance Belgard. Uh, I'm from the Little Black Bear First Nation in Saskatchewan, kind of right by Balcaris and Fort Capella area. Um, I've, uh, I've lived here in Calgary pretty well my, uh, life growing up here, uh, raised my family here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've gone to school and, and, and all those things. Yeah. How long have you been creating art for? Uh, I would see probably about five years or so. Um, I started kind of playing around with the, the concept or the idea of, of working in the art realm. I, it's, it's really funny because I never actually considered myself to be any sort of artist for that matter. Um, I worked in, in human services for a really long time and um, worked with people and, and really enjoyed that. And then it wasn't until um, I met uh, my former partner and, and um, who's passed away now, and uh, Amy Willier. Uh, she had um, kind of introduced me to the idea that you know, maybe I could put some, some art on, uh, on feather boxes because that's what I was doing, uh, at that particular time. And so I started exploring that. And from there, I started doing some carving, more pyrography art. Uh, and then I started exploring what else could I do with, with that artistic side of, of, of things. And, uh, things just sort of snowballed from there as, it was really interesting because I, like, I always had a hard time when she would call me, she would say hey, that I was an artist or she would, she would introduce me as an artist. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know about that. But, uh, as, as time has gone on and I've, I've really kind of come to, you know, within myself, uh, through that, I, I've, um, yeah, start, started taking on the role a little bit more. How has it been to watch what you create evolve over that time? Uh, man, it's, it's been amazing. Um, the, the journey through, through art and through, you know, um, cultural, uh, learning, like they really, um, it's been like, I've always worked in the litigious community here in Calgary, uh, from my time as being a recruiter to, um, in, in my human services, um, work. And then, uh, now as an artist and so. It um, it wasn't until I was I became an artist that I really got a little deeper into the cultural connections and really it 
uh, getting to understand who I am as an indigenous person. And so, you know, for me, being able to create these works uh, is also being able to um, create my own self-identity in that. So it's been integral to your cultural identity? Absolutely. It's been huge. Um, and every every step of the way, I, I seek to, to build a stronger understanding of that. And so uh, everything from my woodwork to uh, the apparel that I create and the rib ribbon skirts that I make, um, you know, I, every step of that process has been a, a cultural learning for me. Do you have a favorite piece you've made? Do I have a favorite piece? Um, I have to say um, it was probably my United design. Um, it it really kind of just came to me, and I felt that it was just such a powerful piece. Like, really, it was just a really simple, like, clean design, and but it had such a huge impact and on on the way that uh, I moved forward in, in my work. Do you have any advice for any Indigenous looking to start a creative journey? Um, my biggest piece of advice, I think, is is to explore. Have fun uh, with that process, really, um, it, and just be true and 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 genuine to to yourself. Um, I think those are the biggest pieces that I think have helped me learn in in that process, and and really just just explore. Yeah, it's always, um, it's always in that process that I've, I've learned the most. How long have you been involved in the Indigenous art market scene in Calgary? Um, I think it's been about three years now, two, two, three years. Um, I started, uh, primarily really I started in non-Indigenous markets, um, or traditionally Indigenous markets. Uh, but I would still continue to sell uh, some Indigenous-focused uh, products. Um, and then it wasn't until probably uh, an authentically Indigenous uh, market that I had uh, tested tested it out and really enjoyed it. And I really enjoy the community that, that I've uh, been able to build through it. Like, I, I've met a lot of really great people, uh, some of my now very best friends, so... How has it impacted you being received so well by the Indigenous art community here? <laughs> um, I think that it motivates me more to um, to help be that representation, to help lead that journey for young entrepreneurs, and people who are just starting out. Um, you know, I, it's I've sort of built some sort of reputation, I think. Um, that uh, I'm that type of person that they go to with respect to, you know, what, what they're selling and, and, um, you know, they, they come to me for that, which is really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed, um, seeing people grow. Uh, in their Thank you for any non-Indigenous who have never been to an Indigenous art market before. What would you tell them about it? Um, I would say come immerse yourself. Uh, in in the in the market, really um, let your guard down. Let all of your your previous fears uh, and maybe uh, biases, uh, you know, kind of let let go of those, and really um, be willing to have conversations with people um, and and vulnerable about those conversations. Because uh, in that vulnerability, I think is a is an opportunity to really learn and engage. Um, and you, you get a chance to, um, hear a different side of the story. Like, yeah. To build all that, how can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous in the art scene? Yeah, absolutely. A big example of that is, is, is working with, uh, Calgary Tellus Convention Center. They've, uh, they've really just, uh, opened things up for us. And, and said, let's, let's do this. Let's make this work. And I think the more, when we talk about this is that, you know, I, I find that companies and, and people really, if they say, well, I'm going to go back and think about it, we're going to go back and talk about it. What happens a lot in that, um, aspect is, is they start to build up walls without even really realizing it. And so 
uh, in just just doing, just just jumping in and and taking that leap uh, without all of that fear, uh, and then and then sort of building from there as as probably I think the better. Uh, if you could describe your art in one sentence, how would you do so? Um, how, how I've never really thought about how I would really describe my art. Uh, I think that um, really building culture through learn it um, is is kind of where I've I've come from in my art um, and getting to learn all the different processes getting to learn how to make drums, getting to learn how to make ribbon skirts. Everything's been built by learning uh, and uh, immersing myself from that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my last question for you is, what do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work that you're doing now? Ooh. <laughs> um, I, think that, I think there would be a lot of pride. I think that they would say that um, we're bringing culture to life uh, for for people, for non-Indigenous people alike. Um, I think that it's, you know, in the art community, I think, is is helping build those bridges uh, with non-Indigenous people because it is such a, it touches people differently, um, and it, it's, it's, it's a different story. I think they'd be proud too. I think so. A, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's deadly. So we are Treaty 7 Artisan Collective. Um, we're comprised of four different artists, three different companies. Uh, I am Sharon. I'm part of Thunder Beings Beating. Zin is a good job. Uh, Jojo Crochaldata. Um, Sinajuna Sutina, Ua Eka'ala I'm Jojo. I'm the other half of Thunder Beings Beating, also part of the Treaty 7 Artisan Collective. I am Alexis Soto. I am Serene Soto Creations. I am the second business in Treaty 7 Artisan Collective. When did Treaty 7 Artisan Collective start? Um, yeah, so actually, our, we, so the third business who currently isn't here today. Uh, they, we were working with them or we were at a ceremony last year and we had, um, a couple markets coming up that I personally couldn't attend, but they could. And we had been friends for quite a few years. And so we were like, oh, let's team up and work together. Um, and so that was about last year, last summer, last August. And then over the last year, we've, um, you know, become this team of, of these three businesses that work really well together. And yeah. Thank you. If you could individually talk about how it's impacted you to be a part of the collective, that'd be awesome. So it's been amazing being part of the collective. Uh, we do a lot of craft nights together. And we get to uh, inspire each other on different things to make and things that we could adjust or just bounce ideas off of each other. And then when it comes to markets, it's great because sometimes some of us are working or out of town, so we're able to support each other in that way. Uh, yeah, Sharon touched on it very nicely. The whole collaborative um, piece, being able to share ideas, um, you know, being able to ask questions, being like, oh, I don't know the style, or you're able to teach me. Um, it's just very community and like very healing in that sense. So it's been quite amazing on this journey. Uh, yeah, what they both said, um, and it's a very confidence building uh, thing as well, just to be able to have the community surrounding the supportive community surrounding myself as well so i was the last person into the collective um and yeah it's it's been a great thing and what they said for sharing markets as well and it's also been nice to be able to split fees as well because marketing is expensive so it's nice to have the the collaborative efforts of being able to split the time split the cost and then create together with these incredibly wonderfully talented folks so yeah it's been a it's been a great thing thank you how long has yeah you all been in the indigenous artist market uh well i i started marketing um when i was going to school so i think uh I misled you in my last interview where I said it was been a couple of years. It's actually been about six years where I started uh, Indigenous marketing 
And then that's kind of opened up to just like all markets, right? But the indigenous ones really are close to home because there are some incredibly great people and I love to see everybody. It's like a reunion every time. Um, I think for Thunder Beings Beating, um, we started about maybe two and a half years ago. And, um, and yeah, and just like, just what Alexis said, it's just like, it's so great to be able to come to these spaces where we like laugh. And if you ever been in a room with an indigenous like group, it's just like, we laugh so loud and it just, it's so empowering and so healing. Yeah, you, you will touched on that so well. Um, it, and really, another really great thing about just being in indigenous markets is like how much everyone else supports each other too. Um, different tips and tricks on how to set up better or things to like use for your displays. And yeah, the wagon tip was a great idea. <laughs> how has the markets received your artwork? It really depends on the market, I think, and like the placement, the different crowds that are coming through. Um, yeah, I would say overall very well. A lot of people give different ideas on what they'd like or order custom pieces as well. Yeah, um, Sharon has currently some button earrings on the table where um, they received the buttons from their grandma and then they like beaded them and like everybody who hears the story of that is just so touched and like generational like passing it on. It just like everybody just is so happy about it and they're just, yeah, it's just amazing to see everything and how we grow as, you know, as a group. So the indigenous markets um, have accepted our products very well. Um, the it's because our products, a lot of them are geared for indigenous people. So I like our cups, people like to have a really good laugh at them. That's the Crafty Machif, makes some really great cups. Uh, these folks are really great at the beadwork. So it's it's been very, um, it's been great to become a, a part of the indigenous art communities. What would you say to someone who is not Indigenous, who has never been to an Indigenous market before, who would like to attend one? I, I would say come and talk and laugh and enjoy the art market. Like uh, we are a very welcoming, accepting people. And I would say come down and, and have a look at all the incredibly talented folks and all of their wonderful well, stuff. And don't feel bad about buying it and wearing it um that is a, a way to honor us too yeah please come spend time with us uh because we want to heal that relationship with non-indigenous people opening our spaces and and you making the choice to come come visit with us that is amazing that that's how we're gonna move on on our, on our healing journey also asking questions is always good um yeah being respectful of the questions and just always checking with different people on uh yeah, different products or different uses for things. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? I think there is this, so like, you know, we talk a lot about allyship in the sense of those relationships with um, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. And so like one thing that non-Indigenous people can do in that relationship is that, um, is, is protection on the sense of like, Sometimes we're in spaces as Indigenous people where it's not safe, but we want to share our artwork. We want to exist in a good way. Um, so sometimes, like, as non as a non-Indigenous person, like, just, make, just making sure those spaces are safe and advocating for us in that way. Exactly. Uh, making sure our, our, you know, our, the spaces to share are, are, are safe and exactly, like, uh, wearing our art, buying our art, telling people where you got your art and yeah just talking with us asking the questions you know sharing your story as well because we love to hear where other people come from too uh, if you could summarize your artwork in one sentence how would you do so i like to use different like unique ways of incorporating beading into different pieces of jewelry one sentence um i guess it's an intergenerational craft that promotes healing and love affordable art made by an indigenous person with love. what do you think your ancestors would say that you can see the work that you're doing now those were my buttons <laughs> <laughs> there's the laughter <laughs> well, no i think they'd be very like honored and happy that like um i'm continuing it and that I kept up with it because I spent a few years without really touching beads for a while. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I picked it up. I just haven't been able to stop. But I think they'd like that. Yeah, I think my ancestors would be in the same boat about, you know, just like being extremely like joyful around the idea that we're continuing these practices and, and building community since, you know, that was taken away from them. So I think they'd be pretty overwhelmed with joy. I don't know, like what these fine folks said. Um, I think our ancestors would be very proud of the fact that we haven't given up. We are still here. We are still creating and we are still using those talents that creator gave us. What does cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation look like in the art community? Um, I would say like appropriation would be um, taking the ideas or like financial um, ability away from indigenous artists um, or participating in closed practices without having those rights. So the appreciation side to that is like being a, buying a ribbon skirt from somebody who is Indigenous um, and then wearing it at ceremony or at a round dance or at a, you know, Indigenous celebration or wearing a pair of earrings that are made from porcupine quills or birch bark um, that was harvested in a good way. That money is like going back to those Indigenous artists and you're using and you're show, showcasing their, their brilliant work. So that's the appreciation side. Oh, um. Maybe partly too about how like um, things are collected. So like if there is medicines or furs, making sure that they're um, ethically sourced or in like in a good way. Um, yeah, I think the biggest one is make sure it's supporting indigenous artists and not taking away from that. So yeah, it, and and again, it's not um, buying dream catchers from China or you're buying indigenous art that comes from non-indigenous people. Um, so it is appreciating uh, and giving back to the artists that uh, have made the pieces. So again, it is all about asking the questions um, where, you know, where was it made, who made it and where the stuff came from. Um, a lot of our work takes a lot of time. So we have a, we, we've had some people come in where they try to like, barter the prices down by a ridiculous amount that doesn't even really pay for our time or even the materials we use um so even just like you know if if you do want to barter like be respectful of what you're going to offer my last question is do you have any advice for any indigenous artists looking to get into the market scene um from an artistic point of view i would just state like be authentically you in these spaces um you know we often as indigenous people need to mask when we're in non-Indigenous uh, spaces. So, you know, part of that healing journey is being you and being, uh, you know, some of those teachings that those ancestors uh, have passed on and some of those skills that we that have been passed on. It's just like, be, be wholeheartedly who you are when you're in these spaces. And I would like to add too, to not be afraid to ask questions of other vendors, um, approach us, we're, we're, most of us are very approachable and we would love to share the information that we've learned um you know starting off with doing our own vendoring so i would say yeah be yourself ask lots of questions don't be afraid to approach us and you know come on down and set up networking is a great way of um just making friends and like getting more into community and yeah getting a lot more advice from people on ways to set up or uh things like a wagon Oh, uh, where, where the markets are is a big one. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So just ask questions, uh, make friends with the people around you. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share at all? No, no, yeah. I don't think so. Dog, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much. <laughs> Sanze, my name's Amanda. Uh, my business name is Ata Wilkemik, uh, which means store trading post in Cree. And uh, I was born in Calgary. I am a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. My mother is Cree and her parents come from Saskatchewan area. Uh, that's about as far back as the history that I uh, am aware of. So I, I reside on at Treaty 7, Blackfoot Territory. Thank you. How long have you been creating art for? I've been making dream catchers for about five to seven years. 
I started off with actually just a, a Dollarama kit <laughs> um, and then sort of taught myself and then it sort of I started uh, practicing more with the dream catchers and it it turned into from a hobby more into a business. When did you start attending indigenous art markets as a vendor? I started with these markets about two years ago. I've done maybe under 10 so far and of indigenous and non-indigenous markets. Do you have a favorite piece you've made? So my favorite pieces that I make are the key uh, keychain dream catchers. I have a lot of fun with those. Yeah, they're hanging there and there as well. Um, so I do a variation of colors. I add some stones, uh, do different charms as well, hummingbirds, and I do some chakra dream catchers as well. So I have a lot of fun with those ones. Do you ever have a hard time letting go of any pieces? No, I don't. So I make all my pieces, I feel, with a lot of love. <laughs> so I'm just happy to give them a new home. Awesome. Uh, do you have any advice for any Indigenous looking to take that next step in becoming an artist? Yeah, I would say just go for it. Everyone starts somewhere. I didn't start with my dream catchers looking like this, that's for sure. My first dream catcher that I made, you would probably laugh. <laughs> so it, it, it takes work and um, you need to just put yourself out there and, and know that uh, it's, it's a really good environment within these indigenous markets. People are really welcoming. So sometimes sales are unpredictable, but you get to meet a lot of great people and, and just network. What would you say to someone who's non-indigenous, who's never been to an indigenous art market, but would like to attend? I would say, uh, come check it out. Everyone's really great and you can learn a lot and you learn a lot through our art, through our people. And uh, we definitely want to teach people and, and share our art. So please check us out. How can non-indigenous better hold space for indigenous artists? I think providing opportunity uh, for Indigenous people to showcase their art and uh, just open more spaces would be great. Sometimes there's these vendor shows and they do welcome Indigenous people, but sometimes it feels we're tucked away. Um, so I feel that our Indigenous market should be more uh, front showcase and Definitely just having us there is great anyway, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Can you speak on what cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation looks like? So cultural appropriation uh, would be if a non-Indigenous person is uh, profiting off of Indigenous-made art. Cultural appreciation is uh, supporting the art and I think there's always a question with non-Indigenous people if, if it's okay to wear Indigenous jewelry. Um, of course, my personal opinion is yes, please do, because it, uh, it really promotes that artist and it promotes our culture. It just shows that we are still here and we will always be here. So you could summarize your creative work in one sentence. How would you do so? Uh, the sentence I would use, I guess, is catch dreams. That's what my little niece <laughs> calls them. So what do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work that you're doing? My ancestors would probably say, uh, what is this Napiguan doing? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think my ancestors uh, would be happy to see that I am reclaiming and uh, proud of my indigenous history uh, because, you know, with everything that's occurred uh, in, in the recent past. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, pain and everything. So if we can bring out the beauty and, and the happiness and reclaim, I think that's that I'm making my ancestors proud by doing that. I think they'd be proud too. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Okay. Good for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, hello, my name is Jennifer Lavasser. I am the owner of J&J's Jewelry Boutique. I am from Treaty One, and I've been residing in Calgary, Alberta for the last 38 years. 
When did you start your boutique? I started my Indigenous line about a year ago. I took an Indigenous arts and entrepreneurship program to get more hands-on experience with leather work, drum making, um, ribbon skirts. Ultimate goal was to um, find out how I'm going to start a business and the steps that I need to take for that is like business plan and you know now figuring out how to market myself as it is just me. How has it been to watch your creative journey grow? Um, I have I've really enjoyed it. So I've only been doing this for about a year now. My first market, I had maybe 50 items and they went pretty quickly. So it kind of gave me a drive to want to create more items and see like what different people enjoy. Cause a lot of my products are more on the contemporary side, more um, modern and a mix of um, the Western and indigenous cultures because I was from the 60s group, so I wasn't able to learn my culture growing up. It wasn't until I was in my 20s. So for me, it's, it's very important to be able to mix them both and you know, have them walking along the same path. The two-eyed C8. <laughs> so arts played a big role in your journey of reconnection? Um, arts played a big role. Like when I was younger, I did I did go to Catholic school. It was a fine arts school, so I was able to learn that I actually do enjoy art. But growing up, um, a lot of people are always telling you that you can't you can't you can't live a life on arts. You know, like <laughs> things like that. So having the ability to show people that. Um, art, art can be used in various ways. It's good for healing. It's good for reconnecting. It's great for networking with other Indigenous artists and the Indigenous community. Do you have any advice for anyone just starting an art journey? I think my biggest piece of advice would be, like, don't be shy to put yourself out there. The worst thing that could happen is people might not enjoy it and they will give you feedback. And if they see something that they like and like people, people are very good at, at letting you know <laughs> whether, whether you're doing the right thing or maybe not. <laughs> How is the indigenous art market community here received you in your work? I think, I think it's been great. Um, I get, I get a lot of the other vendors as customers <laughs> as well. So that's that's a really empowering thing to see that okay there, we're in a room full of let's say 20 artists everybody is coming around looking at your stuff giving you feedback and it's a it's an amazing it's an amazing feeling to be able to have those connections and meet other artists and you know bounce ideas off of each other i think is really great yeah what would you say to any non-indigenous who have never been to an indigenous art market before what would you tell them about them? I would t I would tell people that have not been to an indigenous market that that they're welcome. That's the biggest thing is I think a lot of people are apprehensive being non-indigenous and you know being stuck with like appreciation versus the appropriation because for so long we're told like you can only wear this, you can only wear this, you know, you, maybe you're a little bit too light to to do this and and stuff like that. So I, I, it would be nice for non-Indigenous people to know that they're accepted and that they are, they're supporting our arts and supporting what we are doing. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a really great thing, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Can you speak more on what cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation looks like in the art community? I think, the, I think one of the biggest things is, let's say, for ribbon skirts. A lot of non-Indigenous people are apprehensive to buy the skirts because they're like, this is only for the Indigenous community and it's, and it's us having the ability to share with them is that, no, ribbon skirts can be worn by anybody because you're appreciating our art. The appropriation is going to come from if you're going to be making it and trying to make a profit off of something that came from us and that we've created, um, that's, the, that's the hard part is... <laughs> is trying to let people know that 
if you're if you're shopping from us it it's a great thing we love it um and it it, it is really appreciating us how can non-indigenous better hold space for indigenous artists how can non-indigenous hold better space for the indigenous community i think events like this at the Talos Convention Center really helps us as Indigenous artists. I think that if more organizations were willing to, you know, hold little events like this, whether it's the with the reconciliation, a lot of organizations are doing mini powwows and mini round dances. And, you know, having these non-Indigenous organizations doing that is bringing us closer together as well. I think your ancestors would say they can see the work you're doing now. I think my ancestors would be proud with the work that I'm doing. Having the ability to break intergenerational traumas that all of my family has gone through. Um, we do have a lot of suicides and um, issues like that. So having the ability to share my work and to be living on the right path is a very is a very strong um, thing to have. Hey, they'd be proud too. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Just for any fellow artists or people that are starting out, I think it's a, it's it's a good thing to get yourself out there. Um, there's always a market for indigenous arts, and we like to support each other and you know see people that are doing well and living in the right way. So I think. For anybody that's, you know, apprehensive, just get yourself out there and do it. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> uh, so my name is Tanise Littletent, um, but I go by Tanise Dayrider, which is uh, my adoptive family. I was raised half of my life in Kainai on the reserve and then the other half in Lethbridge. Moved here in 2014, um, have been here ever since. And my name is uh, Skylar Doolittle. I am from Brantford, Ontario. Um, I am from Mohawk, which is in Six Nations. Uh, I have lived in Calgary for since 2000, I believe. How long have the two of you been creating art for? Together, we have been creating, I would say, for a good 36 months. Um, prior to that, I was just kind of doing my own thing, like making myself jewelry um, and kind of venturing out into the community by myself. Um, and then my partner got heavily involved and was received well by the community and he as you can see does beaded hats now um so yeah we've been together doing this for about six months yeah awesome yeah for me it's been um just mostly supporting her on her journey and doing crafts and whatnot and um i think just all the trips to the bead store i was like you know you're know, like oh okay whatever and then i got to beating hats and now you know we're involved in this together and we love it and yeah it's been um an awesome time doing it, being involved with it, different vendors and different places and whatnot. So it's been awesome. Yeah. How has the Indigenous market community here in Calgary received you and your work? I would say pretty positively, to be honest. Um, I think with a lot of, I guess, um, my partner's creativity, it's really reflective in what her work is and how it gets perceived. I think a lot of people respect it and love it. Um, for me, I just I did my first hat not too long ago, and it was it blew my mind how much it was like well taken you know what i mean like people were complimented a lot and stuff like that so i think within the community it's insanely awesome you know what i mean everyone loves it and they support each other especially other vendors you know like we'll go from other vending booths buy something in support of that vendor and then they do the same to us right the vendors will like gift each other um and i think that's like a huge um community in itself is just that's kind of our ways is just gifting and it's Beautiful. Do you have any advice for any artists who are looking to get into the vendor com or market community? Yeah, I do. Um, definitely just post your work, share it with your friends, your family. Um, don't be shy um, and ask for that feedback. You know, um, ask people what they like if you're looking to sell your stuff. Um, but yeah, don't be shy and don't be discouraged. Don't compare yourself to others. Just go for it and it's good to share. And I would say, just be t true to like your own creativity, you know, don't, you know, feel pride in what you do and what you create. So I think make something that's true to yourself, true to what you, you personally love as a, you know, a creative individual. So, and it, it will get perceived well and, you know, people will love it. Thank you. Do you have any advice for any Indigenous who are looking to take that step into a creative journey? Just do it. Honestly, like, you know, as hectic as life could be sometimes, and you might not feel like you have the time or the energy or the money, it's just taking that first step, whether it's buying, you know, beads, you know, I bought my first beads not too long ago, and that's what, you know, 
kind of started it all off, right? And so I would say just just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. So yeah, that's what I would say. I do want to say something about um, Indigenous artists. So like artwork, painting, drawing, things like that. Like I feel like people may um, think there's a high standard for art, but really there's not. I think all art is beautiful and it's just share, you know, like all art is wonderful. Um, you have a place here. You have a place within the vendor community, the market. Yeah, just go for it. For any non-Indigenous who have never been to an Indigenous market before but would like to go, what would you say to them? I have a lot to say. <laughs> um, don't be shy to ask questions. Like, ask questions. Ask, there's no dumb questions. I feel like there's so many people that are unsure about what it means to buy something from an Indigenous artist. Um, support. You're supporting, number one. Um, and then for two, like, wear it. If you're buying it, wear it. Like, that's showing your support. You're allowed to wear it. It's not appropriation. It's purely support. And so I highly encourage anyone to come down to these markets, support by purchasing, you know, um, go admire the artwork, the the jewelry, whatnot. Um, yeah. And I, I second that. I I agree with what she said. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, to build on that, what does cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation look like in the artist community? So this is just my personal opinion. So appropriation is, you know, buying from non-Indigenous, um, very non-Indigenous, non-authentic um, pieces, um, you know, people that may copy a certain style of, of artwork, which is, you know, closer to Indigenous. Um, and a pr uh, appreciation would be, like I said, just going to support those Indigenous artists and appreciating their work, wearing it, supporting by buying, you know, even just sharing business cards. Like, that's huge support, um, like reposting on social media. And I second that as well. So, so how can non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous artists? Inviting inviting the community out, you know, even if it's not, um, if it's a, a, a business meeting or whatever, like a, a, they usually have events around the city and it's just tons of like um, professionals. Invite some vendors out, you know, people like, that's the one way you can support them. Um, creating that space, just make a space for indigenous artists. I, again, I second that a third time, but uh, no, I definitely agree. It's just, there's space for I believe for everyone and if you do something there's no reason why you know especially if you're holding an event i don't see why you can't just invite whoever you know whether it's friends family or an indigenous community to come and take part in that right so i think it's just allowing you know just open the doors for indigenous people to take part in it be involved in your community and also helping themselves helping their creativity journey your their creative journey and whatnot if you could summarize your art in one sentence how would you do it Affordable. Affordable. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I definitely yeah. We create things that we enjoy, that we like. Um, and, you know, there's so many different things you can find at these kind of markets. Um, and a lot of them tend to be jewelry. Um, so, but there's no competition in that. You know, it's like really what you like, um, what your style is. I think for us, it's just we are family that's doing this together. And I think to me, that's what matters. It's the family that's doing it. And... We love doing it. So. It is just close to home, I guess. It's like close to home for us. It's a family thing. Like, as you can see, our son here, uh, my partner here. How important is it to be able to, you know, bring your family to these events and to have them immersed in the culture? Um, I think it's extremely important. You know, um, for me, for example, I didn't grow up with this. So I think, you know, and especially with my partner, she's brought me into this community a lot. And um it's definitely one of those things where it's a little bit more fulfilling, I guess, on my part, just because I never had it. So I think it's extremely important to have your family here. And it's just, you know, like, you know, they're good salesmen, right? So <laughs> I think it's just a, it's always a good thing to have family. And, um, and especially with this event, um, they had dancers here and we had my son and daughter take part in dancing on Stevens Avenue and stuff like that. So I think it's just to be able to have that, let them have that experience, I think is very important and, you know, it's a memory that I hope they don't forget and they take, they cherish. I think it's extremely important to have family involved in these kind of markets um, because it's it's keeping them close to their roots. So for our kids, especially. Um, and then for us, it's just like the whole sense of community here. You know, like there's so many things that happen when um, it, it slows down, like everyone's visiting, like it's just laughs, like we eat together, we talk and it's just such a wonderful community. And I love having my family part of that. Awesome. Thank you. Your ancestors would say they could see the work that you're doing now. I think that they would 
I think that they would be highly supportive. They'd be encouraging. Um, I think they'd be proud. I think they'd be proud of everyone here, you know, like this is how we continue on our, our, our everything, you know, like this is who we are. We're artistic people um, and we share that. Like we're here sharing that with the public in downtown Calgary, like who would have thought, you know? So I think it's, it would be amazing support from our, our ancestors. I, yeah, I agree with that. I think it's just the ability to, you know, have that culture passed down, you know, and I think that's something they would be very proud of, you know, especially given our history with a lot of our culture being, you know, taken away from us and gatekeeped from us. So I think just being able to have an, a vendor, a vendor spot like this showcasing our crafts are important and especially, and I, you know, and again, I think our ancestors would be very proud to see it all come back and, you know, I think they'll be very thrilled. So yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to share? We want to give a huge shout out to Chance Guard. He totally set this up like on his own, coordinated everything, got us the space, and he did it for free for everybody here. Like every, every vendor you see here, like it's a free space. Um, and I just think that's an amazing thing to give back to his community. And just want to say shout out to Chance. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much.